Hey guys, just gets be editor of the Coffee Tavern here. Um, I just wanted you to know that Dino's mic was a little screwed up, and we were looking at the footage pre-editing, and there's really nothing we could do about it, because if we try to fix it, it makes it sound awful, and it's arguably worse than just leaving it like it is. Uh, Dino assured me that this will be fixed for next time, so blame him, and uh, yeah, enjoy the episode. Alright, welcome back. Another episode of the Coffee Tavern. So today we're going to be talking about Black History because it is Black History Month, and we we have slowed down. We have slowed down. So this is currently episode eight. We got two more episodes until we hit season four, but we got some things coming up for y'all. But we're here with a, a new co-host. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Nini, <laughs> the new co-host. <laughs> And today we're going to be talking about Black History Month. I wanted to do it originally in the beginning of the month when the month was, you know, you know coming into Black History Month. So that way it would have been out for a while. But we got caught up on some other things, and now we're currently doing the Black History Month episode. So I think without like any odd like introduction or anything, like we're just going to talk about who actually created Black History Month. Because I feel as though we do Black History Month every year, and we don't ever talk about who actually did create Black History Month? I don't think anybody even knows who this person is. So, who created Black History Month? The, the precursor to Black History Month was created in 1926 in the United States when historian Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Black History Week. It soon later became the month from February 1st to March 1st, which is, I didn't even know it extended into to the March 1st. Carter, Good, Carter Goodwin Woodson was an American historian, author, journalist, and the founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He was one of the first scholars to study the history of the African American dysphoria, including African American culture and way of life. Born December 19, 1875 in New Kansas, VA, and died April 3rd, 1950 in Shaw, Washington, D.C. And that is the person who created Black History. And in my opinion, I didn't even, I didn't even know that. Did you, Nini, did you even know? I, I didn't know that either. Yeah, like, I feel as though, like, it's not mainstream. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not mainstream knowledge. Mm-hmm that people know about and it's weird to me that we go through school and we constantly learn about the same figurehead but we never learned who actually created black history you know what i'm saying yeah. Find that, like weird yeah i find it really weird especially because like when we talk about other history like other months that include like some type of american history like we we know who created it and we know who leads it but I've never known this. Yeah, no, it definitely was a shock to me too because, like, and unless like the way, like the way, I think that what bothers me is like you have to go out of your way to look this up. Like you don't just learn it. You know what I'm saying? You have mm-hmm. to go out of your way to look up who created the month and who really started to, like laying the groundwork for Black History Month. And it's mm-hmm. weird to me that they don't teach it, but they constantly teach about the same figureheads like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Harriet Tubman and mm-hmm. uh, you know some other some other individuals but that that being aside I know you have some people that you um that you also wrote down and I'm gonna let you uh, go ahead and get into that okay um I'm gonna start off with uh Marsha P. Johnson I've uh admired Marsha P. Johnson for quite the while um and I would like to talk about her and what she's done. So Marsha P. Johnson was born August 24th, 1945 and passed July 6, 1992. Uh, Marsha P. Johnson was a well-known activist and prominent figure in the Stonewall Uprising of 1969. Her ambitions were to see queer people set free and share equal rights in the US. And she led many uprisings to help the community as well as um, founded STAR, which is, um, something to help trans young kids in the community um, so they can find like housing and 
they could find things to help them um, mm-hmm. become who they want to be. Um, even though she herself suffered many health issues, she always dedicated her life to helping others and building America to be a better place, especially for young queer people. Mm. That's actually that's actually interesting. So she was that's actually really interesting. She played a factor in helping young African Americans figure out, you know, who yes. they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Like, I know back during that time there wasn't there was absolutely like zero acceptance for that. So that's actually really nice that, that she stuck her her neck out to help these individuals find a place to, you know, thrive and grow and be able to figure out who they are as a person. That's really actually unique that uh mm-hmm. that she did that. Yeah, especially like like her herself being trans, she like obviously like she wanted to help herself in in like a way you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. she she wasn't able to um be herself growing up so she wanted to make a community to help um young black trans people like find their way and help them in that sense yeah no i definitely i definitely get it i definitely understand it was, it was a very uh what, what is what is, what is the word? it was a very re- it's a very rebellious thing that she mm-hmm. did, but it was a very heroic thing that she did. Like, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. She definitely did play a, a, a role on both sides for, you know, the LGBT community and for African Americans. Yeah, that's exactly. Good, that's a good little touch. It, it covers covers both sides the playing field. Mm-hmm. That's why I wanted to uh, bring it up. No, no more. She- she didn't right. only like do things for the LGBT community, but also the African American community. She did. She did. Now, going into that, now this other person, Esther Jones, who is that? Oh, so Esther Jones, um, you know of uh, Betty Boop, right? Yeah. Well, the character, the cartoon character was actually inspired by Esther Jones. Um okay. And she's also known as Baby Esther or Little Esther. And she, like, growing up, like, she she was, like, a, a jazz and soul singer and child entertainer. And she would perform at nightclubs. And she would have her own little, like, um, like little thing that she would do, like, boop, boop, and, like, doo-doo. Like, you know, like, that type of thing, right? Yeah. And so this um, company like saw her like this guy she was at one of her shows and saw her and was like i want to like make like a character out of this so that's how like betty boop was formed and betty boop was um inspired by um esther jones and like her little like you know singing and her little like boop boops and stuff and that's how like boop boopy doop like that that's how that happened and how that got created so like did she ever get the credit for that or so um she did because at one point there was this woman um named like helen helen kate i believe and she actually saw esther jones in a show once and was like i want to do this and so she started doing it and after a while um the cartoon betty boop came out and helen kate was like why are you guys copying me and she took them to court the company who um made um betty boop and they were like first of all (laughs) she's not inspired by you she's inspired by esther jones and they pulled out like straight proof like of that and so of course like she she didn't win the case i would hope not like (laughs) (laughs) yeah you copied off Um, a person that copied off a person you're exactly exactly and it's also kind of like um plays into like the narrative because like a lot of people appropriate like um like other people's things and like um a lot of the times like uh african-american people do not get like credit for what they create and what they make and so this woman like uh helen kate she she's white and she tried to basically take that from her and say it was hers and that happens a lot 
especially to um, people of African American descent. And so to have uh, like the court actually like say like, no, it was Esther Jones that it was inspired by is like, really like an amazing thing like it's really good that like it is that. it is because then she gets to even not even just as the jump there was a lot of black like own groups that sung music and whatnot and then they would take the records and you know whitewash them so that way the white audience can also enjoy the music because they wouldn't buy it uh-huh. if there was a black person on the cover so they would take the songs that these african americans created and have them sung by white people and then sell them mm-hmm. in you know white areas which didn't make any sense to me because it was like it's still the same song you're just singing it that's it and, and you're white yeah so they would put these songs out in, in white areas and then it would take money away from the african-american groups who did the work you know what i'm saying yeah and that happens still in our modern day as well like it there is so many like things like characters that are part of like comics or like books that get put into movies and that are completely whitewashed yeah no yeah i i know what you're talking about and i'm gonna definitely get into it a little bit later but Mm -hmm. however i wanted to talk about the man named abbott now there's a man named abbott laid who laid the foundation for what we eventually birth many black or would eventually birth many black publications including ebony jet essence and black enterprise sheen magazine and more in 1905 abbott founded the chicago defender a weekly newspaper the newspaper of the paper started out with a 25 cent investment and four page pamphlet increasing circulation with every edition the defender played an important role in encouraging african americans to migrate from the south for better economic opportunities success of the paper made Abbott one of the first African-American self-made millionaires. And to be back then to be claimed as the first African-American self-made millionaire, I felt like that was uh, a good touch to put in there because now, you know, in today's society, you know, most of the millionaires are white, you know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. having the first the first African American self in there. It's just a it's just a a nice touch to the to the episode to me. And the only reason why I say this is because he took something that, you know, started off literally as as he said, <laughs> a paper that started out with a twenty five cent investment and four page pamphlet and turned it into what we know, you know, today as B E T. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> like you can see where like his work his seeds that he laid out, like played out throughout time and how it affected, you know, the celebrity side of, you know, African American culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That title is amazing as well. Like self uh, first African American self made millionaire. That's such a like great title to have and it's and exp- it's nice to see. It is. And especially in that time period where they're like, yeah, it was never even a thing, you know what I mean? So Not even like, a thought. Yeah, it was, it was, un, it was unimaginable for that time period. And he pulled it off. So I, yeah. I, I give him his respect. And the next person I wanted to touch on uh, with a distinctive uh, baritone and demanding stature, Don Cornelius helped shift black culture into the spotlight with the creation of the show Soul Train. The hippest trip in America was picked up for national syndication in 1971 with the first episode featuring performers uh, Glass Knight and the Hips, Eddie Kendricks, Bobby Hilton, and Honeycomb. Now, those of you that don't know what Soul Train is, Soul Train was a dance show. Basically, they would play songs that African Americans created and literally dance to it. Like, that, that was the show. It was that and a, a future of other different things that they'd had. They had some... Uh, other episodes featuring uh, some different things as far as interviews and whatnot and stuff like that. But Soul Train was one of the first owned African American like TV shows to be actually played on TV. So it definitely took and, and like like I said about the you know about Abbott, it definitely took a, a 
a different approach and a different turn for African Americans in acting and stuff like that because it opened a doorway for them to be able to get into and really sit and lay down like the pillars for you know some African American uh, actors and singers today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually uh, am a dancer myself, so I know Soul Train, and I've watched many episodes and i i really love soul dream because it actually um brought like recognition to a lot of people and a lot of dancing and a lot of like like marginalized groups you know yeah it definitely opened up a doorway to a lot of different things and a lot of opportunities that actors need to have like for example like will smith he got his foot in the door through you know the foundation and, and you know the work put down by Abbott and Cornelius. So it's mm -hmm. definitely it's definitely these things that we don't talk about that I think we should start actually like teaching because even in school like we don't really know a whole lot about black history. All we know is about slavery. And slavery is something that isn't our history. It is a European history. And the reason why I say that is because, yeah, you know, it affected us deeply. However, it's not us, you know what I'm saying? We're not all just slavery, you know what I mean? We are uh, creators, entrepreneurs, cooks, inventors. Like, we're more than just what they teach us every single year. And I feel as though, in my personal opinion, I don't really understand the process of teaching slavery every single year. I get it. I understand what happened. I know how we migrated and how Abraham Lincoln came out of nowhere and was like, yo, y'all got to get up out of here. But they need to start teaching what it is that Black people have done besides pick cotton. I just don't understand what is difficult about that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just yeah. don't get it. I just don't understand. And it's not even the fact of it being about that in general. I think what bothers me is, is that kids are so, I don't want to say ignorant, but kids are so ignorant today of the idea that an African-American did something else besides slavery, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like did slavery, like they created it. I mean like do something else besides what Martin Luther King was doing and what Malcolm X was doing and what Harriet Tubman was doing. We did a lot of other things that they don't teach you about. And it's difficult for us to talk about anybody else when we're taught the same four people literally from fifth grade to senior year of high school. We've done more things and we will continue to do more things. We are not just what our ancestors were, which was slaves. We are more than that. And I think that's what they should, you know, be teaching, but they don't teach it. Mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. And I agree with everything you're saying as well. Uh, I personally, like, uh, don't want to speak on what you're speaking of because I am not a Black person myself. And I think that you should have this time to, like, speak what you need to say. And I support you like 100% with it. Yeah, like, I agree I mean, with like, also it's everything. Open. I get what you're yeah. saying. Like, I get, I get, I get what you what you mean. And you took a very mm -hmm. appropriate sentence with, with what you were saying. But I'm I open to. I know. I get it. Mm -hmm. But I'm open I, to the idea of having the discussion on it. And it's not. It's not yeah. like you know what I mean. Like, it's not like a weird thing. It's it's yeah. what's going on. Like, and it's it's. It touches me, and only because even in cartoons and whatnot, mm -hmm. there's not really a whole lot of, you know, black cartoons, you know what I mean? Or African American cartoons. There's uh -huh. more cartoons that, like, we can relate to, you know what I mean? Like, that we watch or, like, everyone can relate to. Like, for example, if you were born in 2002 or 2000, growing up, 90s cartoons were the extreme gas. We had Hey Arnold. We had, you know, uh, Cat Dog and a bunch of other, you know, shows that we grew up with that we enjoyed. 
but there was mm-hmm. no shows that we could for you know for African Americans that we could grab onto and actually relate to the character. And they just started putting out these characters that you know we didn't really see every day. For example, Marvel. It took them almost I don't know ten years to drop Black Panther. You know what I'm saying? And oh, that was man. only one of the black heroes in the entire franchise. And there's many more that they didn't touch on that actually link to the story. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I completely understand what you mean. Like, uh, I Marvel is... I love Marvel, but they... Th- them and their representation, uh, not good. Like, exactly. They, <laughs> seriously. I love, I love Marvel to this day. Spider-Man is my favorite superhero. However... It pains me to know that there's other African American superheroes that could have been brought in to the fold that were brought in way too late, and now they're only bringing them in so they can get that other percentage that they're not getting of money, and that's mainly black people. A lot of African Americans went to go see Black Panther because that was the only hero that we had that dropped. That's it. So we, of course, us being African Americans, we're excited. We're gonna go see this movie. Another prime example, I'm gonna jump back to it, but actually they're redoing The Proud Family after it got canceled uh-huh. because a not enough white children could relate to the show. What? Exactly, it was canceled. I, exactly, no one knows about I did not it. I know that. Exactly, it was canceled because not enough kids, you know, quote unquote, could relate to the characters. But oh. us being, you know, or me being African-American, I can relate to the show because it, it touched deeply in, in black culture and what a black household or an African-American household would be like. So mm. how the grandma acted, how the mom acted, how the dad acted, it was stuff that I could relate to because it's stuff that, you know, happened in the house, you know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. of course it touches differently on different shows. For example, uh, I can't even think of a, a, a Disney a Disney show. Um Mm. I can't even. I can't even. I can't even think of anything. Uh, mm. I'm hit. I know. I'm hitting a. I'm hitting a wall here because I had a point that I was gonna make, and then it slipped my mind. Hey Arnold, uh, for good example. Good Look Charlie. Yeah, there Uh-oh. you go. Yeah, or go like Good Look Charlie. Good Look Charlie isn't a cartoon, however, it is um. a show really casted around European people. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it touches in on the craziness in the family, you know, and how that stuff goes within the house. But what the proud family was trying to do was they were trying to connect to African-American kids. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Back then, we didn't have any shows that really touched down into the household of African-Americans. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then when they gave us that, kids apparently couldn't relate to it. Now, kids can relate to Good Luck Charlie, right? Because Good Luck Charlie, I'm not, I don't have anything against Good Luck Charlie. I'm just saying in general. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I'm not going to lie. I watched it too. It was a good show. But mm-hmm. what I'm saying is it touches down only a particular group of individuals. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So for the show to be canceled, you know, the Proud Family to be canceled because it didn't touch another specific group of individuals. But for the individuals that like needed the show and it touched on it and they took it away, it just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now they're bringing yeah. it back. And note, and mind you, it's coming out in Black History Month. Hmm. It's honestly. But, you know what I'm saying? It, it, to be honest, it just. With that, it just makes it seem like it's only for the money. It is. Because think of it like this. I was hype as hell to see the trailer for them to drop the Proud Family again. And I'm like, yo, there's no way that they're about to bring the show back. And then I, I, it skipped my mind that it's coming out in Black History Month. So here's mm-hmm. what bothers me. They could have did this anytime. Why are you picking a specific month for African-Americans and dropping mm-hmm. a show that you had control over for years right now in Black History Month. It's not an event. Yeah, it's... it's a show that we should have been had. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah. Miles Morales. He got a movie, right? And it really mm-hmm. did, you know, relate to African American children because like Stan Lee said, anyone could be behind the mask, right? Mm-hmm. He can be black, white, orange, purple, doesn't matter. It's for everyone. You know, that's why you can't see Spider-Man's face. That was the reasoning behind why he made Spider-Man the way his costume is. Miles Morales was the black Spider-Man, as everybody calls him, because he's the only African-American Spider-Man besides Miguel O'Hare, or Miguel O'Hare, who's Hispanic. Miles mm-hmm. is also Hispanic, but he's predominantly African-American, which is why he's called and nicknamed the black Spider-Man. Kids related to that, because we never seen you know what I'm saying? We never seen Spider Man black. We seen him white. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So kids really, African American kids was like, damn, like that's my Spider Man. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's it's great. Like that's why representation matters. Like imagine growing up and not being able to see yourself in these cartoons and shows and movies you watch, and it, it just that's why representation matters so people can grow up seeing themselves exactly in these roles yeah like every movie that drops i don't mean to cut you off no you're good no no you go every movie that comes out the main character is always white and i have nothing against that the Mm -hmm. problem with this is every single time they produce a movie with african americans whether it be on netflix whether it be on, you know, Amazon Prime or whether it be in the movie theaters. Where is the cast of these characters predominantly at? Hmm. So take it like like actually like take a guess. Like why? No, like where are these characters? At? like what is the setting of these movies oh exactly oh yeah it's either uh, yeah slavery movies or stereotypical to, yeah or them trying to make it out of their bad neighborhood you get what i'm saying mm-hmm. or yeah about police brutality or you know what i'm saying like something that involves them not having enough money to get something and they gotta rob something, or they gotta, you know, be gang affiliated or something. These types of movies annoy me. Granted, I watched them, because that's all I seen growing up. That's, that's, there was no good black movies that were just them just not in a bad neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? Or just not yeah. doing anything stereotypical. And it makes it weird to have actors continue to do these roles granted they have to make money they have to make a living Mm -hmm. but there's a line that you know i'm saying that i just wouldn't cross as an actor in my personal opinion i'm not about to go into a movie about slavery and relive and you know not necessarily relive but re-image what it looked like to be a slave i'm not doing that for what? Mm-hmm. Why would I go out of my way to get thousands of dollars for a film about my answers and how poorly they were treated? What is the gain from that? There is no gain. I'm not teaching anybody anything. We've already been taught about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like, are you degrading yourself as an actor or you just have no moral line to where you can go, you know what? I don't really need the money for this, but I could do it for something more positive instead of playing a playing in a movie where I'm a slave. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I completely understand. And I don't think they really touch on that. Like, I don't really think they get it. Like, when they read the script, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is, this, this is gonna be it. <laughs> I can do this instead mm-hmm. of actually reading the script and going, oh, oh, all right, yeah. So you want me to be a slave, a movie? You know what I mean? Like you, like you, 
Like, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. And it's not even it's not even that. Going back to representation and shows and whatnot, they have these actors in, like, the most stereotypical situations they could possibly be in. Even, mm. even you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, who's the dude from Key and Pilly? Uh... I'm not the, sure. the, yeah, the person who created Get Out, right? Uh-huh. It was a movie about an African American guy who was dating a, a white woman, right? Mm-hmm. You come to find out that the white woman was extremely racist and her family was racist <laughs> and that they were kidnapping African Americans to steal their bodies. What are you what are you doing for us as a whole? That movie was a, a good movie. It was. It touched in on a lot of systemic racism that, you know, that we see today. However, you're not helping us out. You're scaring the shit out of us because now you're putting the the process into your mind that African-Americans dating white people can potentially be a problem. You know what I'm saying? You're not Mm -hmm. doing it consciously, but you're scaring people because the movie was considered a horror movie about an African-American person yeah. dating a white a white person and getting killed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, like fear-mongering. Like- exactly. You're scaring the shit out of African-Americans and potentially lowering the factor of, you know, what's, it's still not really even normalized. They're trying to normalize mixed-race couples. Mm-hmm. yeah i think like before like i think before you even hit the 2000s like mixed race marriage was barely just like legalized but what i was gonna uh say as well i i, I just completely forgot what i was gonna say just give me a second <laughs> mm-hmm. i also think that like um in another like way like it's kind of like um there's people out there that are actually like like that too though like yeah, there's white people no, out there that are like exactly that act like that it, and i feel like if you are going to watch a movie like that you have to go in there knowing knowing that but also knowing th- that it's not always like that you know what i mean like yeah. if you show a child that movie they're gonna they're be like gonna, damn i'm not about to date no traumatized <laughs> They're gonna be traumatized. Exactly, and here's what here's what here's where it even gets more like like bad, right? They show movies like that. They show movies about us being slaves. They show movies about us being in stereotypical situations, which puts people in the mindset of going, you know what? This this isn't all we are. We're not this. You know what I'm saying? And I, mm-hmm. it's funny to watch, right? Because stereotypical movies about you know my culture is it's considered funny in my culture it's funny movies because it's just it's really stereotypical but at the same time it's like it's very it's it's a very serious thing that we should not be laughing at and the only reason why i say this is because we're laughing at them selling our stereotypes to us you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and to me i I just I, i just don't understand why we deem that funny i get it like the jokes in there we can relate to Mm because you know some stereotypes people follow you know what i'm saying and it's funny but stop (laughs) stop doing them you know what i mean yeah it's like though like it's not something that uh a non-african american person should be laughing at though like it's like it's like in your community where that should be happening but like i feel like the the big problem is that like when like Mm, white directors or like someone who is an African American makes write a movie these, like yeah, that. Yeah, and they write these scripts like 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 what like what is what is your real motive? Like what is your plan? Mm, <laughs> yeah. The movie that you're writing is very, very strong. It's a very strong movie for someone not of that skin tone to be writing. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I'm nobody who hasn't experienced it themselves shouldn't be writing about it. Like, yeah, like 
I get it. You want to, you know, really touch individuals with this movie, but you're touching this, like touching individuals with this movie, the wrong individuals, because you're still acting out slavery in these movies. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, slaves again, whipped, lynched. It's what happened back then, and you're playing it again in front of us with profit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Not even just that, but to go, I know I, I know I keep jumping back into it, but the Star Wars trilogy, right? The new trilogy that came out, they advertised Finn as a African American Jedi, right? Which kids really didn't have mm-hmm. besides Samuel L. Jackson, and he died. So to see to see Finn up there advertised as the first African American Jedi. And they steal his role away and give it to, uh, as we know today, Ray Skywalker. I forget the actor's name, but Ray Skywalker. It's a slap in the face because you sold us that we were getting an African-American Jedi. Then you gave his role away and he complained about it. He was very upset about him losing his role. He was supposed to be the main character and they took his role away because apparently it didn't match with the storyline oh my gosh and he was upset he said he didn't want to do the movies anymore but because he had a contract he had no choice you know what I mean Mm -hmm. but to me that's a slap in the face again because we all went to go see that movie and we seen it and we're waiting for the next movie to drop and then it comes to find out he's not the main character at all Raise the main character. You sold us a movie about a stormtrooper, an African American stormtrooper who's force sensitive and is a Jedi. And then you give us the next movie and go, yeah, let's stop all that. He's not a force sensitive individual. He's not a Jedi. He's just a guy with a gun who screams Ray every 15 seconds. Um. I think Star Wars has, like, the worst representation ever. Like, the whole... Yeah, they have all the aliens and stuff, but, like, yeah. there's not like... really a whole... Af- there's not a lot of African Americans no. in the leads. Like, there's... And that's just completely upsetting. And, like, I've seen, like, him himself has, like, protested over it. Like, he's 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 talked about it so many times. Yes, like... because he's genuinely upset. He thought yeah. that he was going to be able to give back, you know, to the young African-American community and go, like, y'all can be Jedi, too. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. but but no, but no. <laughs> Disney, Disney and whoever was working on the movie was like, yeah, no, no, that's not happening. Disney, Disney completely sucks. I, I hate Disney is, I don't know. Disney's representation lacks. Yeah, yeah to, an, to an extent. Like they have a lot of good things they've created in storylines, but like, it's yeah, we're we're missing a lot here. Yeah, and not even just that, the princess and the frog. Why did they put Tiana in a racist time period? Literally, because the because she was working hard to get her own business. If you notice, she lived in the ghetto, and her mother was sewing dresses for her best friend who was white and very wealthy. Mind mm-hmm. you, Tiana was taught to work for everything that she, you know, wanted in life. Granted, that's a good skill to teach kids. However, when she goes and she has all the money to pay for, you know, the building that she wants, they go, no, and they say, a person of your background wouldn't be able to continue to pay for the payments for this business. She has the money. They, she told them, I'm giving you the money today. They meet her and they say no. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then she gets turned into a fucking frog and then they, you know, do the whole Disney, Disney, Disney no, skit. Like, <laughs> she was a frog for like all of the movie. Exactly. She was a, that's another thing. She was a frog for the entire movie. She wasn't even supposed to be a frog. That's not how the movie goes. <laughs> It's not even how the story goes. They wanted to put a twist on it. I get it. 
But that's not how the movie goes. Soul, another good African American movie. He was blue for a good chunk of the movie. Granted, they did touch in on the barbershop scene, and, you know, about jazz and all that. And I, I thought that was really nice. You know, that was really good. Yeah, you know, it was a really good touch. However, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, did, don't know. I didn't I hear know. that. I apologize. Oh, I was saying, you know, the movie Soul. Uh, oh, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was blue for the majority of the movie. They did touch in on the fact, you know, about how, you know, African-American barbershops are. You know, like, that, that's part of our culture. You know, the barbershop is a place where we go to commute, or not commute, we go to communicate and talk to, you know, one another about, you know, you know, share our stories and whatnot and get a haircut. Mm-hmm. That, to me, I found, you know, that's, you know, that's what I do at the barbershop. That's exactly what I do. I go in there, I bust everybody's balls, and I leave. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> It, it's a, it's a, it, it was, that was a good touch, and that was well represented. However, mm-hmm. they give, if you notice, Disney princesses aren't that diverse. Tiana's the only African American princess that they have on that, on that little stash there, right? Mm-hmm. They touch into different, you know, cultures like Ireland and, mm-hmm. you know, you know, uh, Hawaiian, you know, Moana. And all that stuff. That's that's nice. That's cool. However, it took them a long time to do it. You know what I mean? Mm, definitely. Like. And then these... they put. And then they dropped the movie for Tiana. And again, like I was saying earlier, they put her in a racist time period. Yeah. I it, it like th- like these couple of years they've been coming out with like better things but literally all the the past princesses come from like time granted, period they, yeah but granted they didn't have it good either but you get what i'm no, saying they had happy no, that's not what i'm saying i'm saying like well yeah what i'm saying is like all of these like time periods they've involved like their princesses in are racist time periods and especially like tiana's like they they literally could have made it about like any time period before like it was before it was released and they chose like one of the most racist time periods exactly and it's not even it's not even it's not even just that all right i'll give it the benefit of the doubt mulan right Mm -hmm. that was a very bad time period for women and that was a really empowering movie for asian uh asian american women and even asian women you know that they were powerful and that they had you know they had something more than what their culture deemed them to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that was well represented. But at the end of Tiana, right? Mm-hmm. She's not necessarily a princess. And the only reason why I say this is because she gets her dream, right? Mm-hmm. She works hard to get her dream. She mm-hmm. got, you know, the business and whatnot. It took the entirety of that movie for him to kiss her, making her a princess, right? By, you mm-hmm. know, default, you know what I mean? And then yeah. their happy ever after, you know, happy ever after was them opening up that, that restaurant. And in my opinion, that's good and all. However, they don't, you know what I mean? I, I really, get it. Yeah, they don't really get a happy ending. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's more of like uh like it's a good movie. The ending is nice, but it's not really a. Not it's really not a, like as like the same as the others, like exactly. the other Disney princess movies. And it's not even it's not even that, but it goes it goes into everything you know. Black History Month is, and this is this is our history, you know, past and present. And they're even pushing mixed race couples, as you as you may know and seen on commercials or whatnot, that it's okay. And they're trying to program people to be more accepting of it, which I don't understand why. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Craig in the Creek touches really good on African American culture. It's an actual show that I want like my brother and my sister to watch. Because it's actually they touch on it a lot, right? Craig's brother. I- is dating a white woman 
Mm-hmm. And they show a very healthy relationship between the two. As they should be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you get what I'm saying? But there's yeah. always that stereotypical part of, you know, not Craig in the Creek. They touch on it very good. Other shows where they go, the African American father is, you know, he leaves or he's not there or he's not around. And the kid's trying to figure out if he's black or if he's white. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. that, it bothers me. You know what I mean? Because granted, the stereotype, the stereotype that, you know, African American fathers leave is a very strong stereotype. Is, you know, most of the time it's correct. However, they shouldn't teach that that's what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's really I love Craig of the Creek. Like I love watching it. And they actually show healthy healthy couples and healthy healthy relationships in that exactly. show. And then they touch in on the grandma who was a Black Panther and she was teaching she was teaching children that you know were watching the episode that they weren't terrorists, that they were fighting for their rights. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That they weren't just throwing, you know, throwing mazel tovs in the buildings and whatnot, and, you know, wrecking havoc and doing riots, that they were actually doing peaceful things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where, like, you know, and another thing, Black History Month is on the most coldest, cloudiest month. I don't like that. And the shortest month. And the shortest month. I don't like that. I don't like it at all. Why would you, like, I get it, an African American created this month. But they don't really touch on, like, how he, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm, I don't yeah. believe that he decided that February was going to be mm-hmm. Black History Month. I feel like he had an original idea, and they were like, nah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it just took Biden to make it a federal holiday. Mm-hmm. Oh That's God. another thing. It took, we had Black History Month for years, and they just made it a federal holiday. Like, it's now an official federal holiday. I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't get it either. Obama, you was in office. Like, <laughs> you had the power oh to my do God. this and you didn't do it either? Like, I don't I don't get it. I don't understand. And that that's 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 it for my rant on, on Black History Month. I, I, I love us. I hope we're all doing good. Even even our our cousins over there. And, you know, I hope everybody's having a, a, a good Black History Month. Nene, do you have anything that you would like to add to this outro of Black History Month? Um, happy Black History Month. And I hope things change for the better. I hope more representation comes. And I hope you guys are able to see things that aren't, you know, trauma-based all the time. Um, but yeah, happy happy Black History Month. Indeed. I hope y'all took or didn't take certain things that I was saying out of context as far as, you know, us, you know, between, you know, white people and black people. I respect us all equally. I love us all as a whole. But we need to be taught more about us and not what we used to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that being said, that's all I got. Um, The next episode is going to be episode nine. And then we'll pretty much damn that being in, in season four. And we got some we got some wild stuff going on in season four that we're trying to get into place. And you know, that's gonna be it for this episode.